But what we're doing is, uh, as you, where we've been is in chapter 1, we looked at united in Christ, we looked at united in the Spirit, and then in chapter 2, we looked at united in purpose, and we looked at united in one another. And then in uh, chapter 3, we looked at the grace, or united in grace, and united in love. And uh, Rich shared last week on united in diversity. And uh, this morning, what I'm going to be looking at, which is one of my favorite topics, is united in the church. And so, here we go. And I've just got all these funny things that are popping up on my screen. Anyway, so let's start. Let's go for it. So if you've got your Bibles, and I've gone the wrong way, let's go to Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 7. It says, but to each one of us, grace has been given as Christ has apportioned it. And I know Rich went through that last week. He finished off his preach on it. But it's kind of like this, uh, this straddling or this bridge between these two aspects of chapter 4. And then it says, this is why it says, when he ascended on high, he took many captives and gave gifts to his people. What does he ascend? What does it mean? Except that he also descended to the lower regions. He who descended is the very one who ascended higher than all the heavens in order to fill the whole universe. So Christ himself gave apostles and prophets and pastors or evangelists and pastors and teachers to equip his people for the work of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach the unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God to become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Then we will no longer be infants, tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of the people and in their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect a mature body of Him who is the head, that is Christ Jesus from whom the whole body joined and held together by every supporting ligament grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. So what we've seen and what Rich spoke on was Paul moves from this issue of protecting unity. Remember last week, this whole thing of we as the church, the thing that can damage the church the most is when we are not unified. Remember what Psalm 133 says, when there is unity, God commands his blessing in life. So where do you think the enemy is going to attack us in our relationships? And that's why Paul says we need to remain humble, we need to be gentle with one another, and we need to be patient. Some people are just a lot slower than others to actually get an understanding. And what happens if we don't protect that? We undermine the purposes of God that we've gone through throughout the whole of Ephesians. And so he talks about this fact that we need to move from this unity or this protecting of unity, our relationships, to protecting the variety of the giftings in the church. And he starts with that but. But to each one of us, grace has been given as Christ has apportioned it. So remember that there's a responsibility to keep the unity of the Spirit, but God's grace is given in these different measures. So it's kind of like, what are you trying to say? And it's often, hopefully I'm going to... um, you know, break down some of the confusion around the gifts that are in the church this morning. But what this means is that each Christian has a different role to play. Each one of you here is not the same as the other. I know that might come as a shock. But, but often what happens is, is that people try and be what, what, they, what their mentors look like. They try and be like somebody else. They try and clone people in the church. We don't want a church full of clones. I mean, could you imagine this church being just full of Gary's? That would be the most boring, crazy place. Look, we'd get a lot done. But <laughs> we'd probably kill a lot of people in the process. The point is, is that we all have these different roles. We're not identical. And, and there's a combination of giftings. Each one of us has a certain uh, combination of the giftings that we're going to be talking about this morning to different degrees. But I'll get on to that in a moment. And the thing is, is when I operate on my gifting, which hopefully I'm doing now, hopefully I have a teaching gifting, and hopefully as I'm speaking to you, grace flows from me to you. But if I was up on the worship team this morning, I promise you grace would have flowed from you to me. And that's why we need a church that's operating in the gifting for the grace that's been apportioned by Jesus. He chooses, He apportions, and He gives the giftings. So let's not try. I know sometimes we have to um, play out a position. That's cool. But in terms of what God has called us to, let's play in the positions and the giftings that God has given us. We're not trying to fit this mold. There's a variety of the Spirit. So as much as we are responsible to be keeping the unity of the Spirit... We are also responsible to keep the variety of the Spirit and also not to get jealous and envious of what other giftings 
people have in the church. Now verse 8 to 10. I missed verse 7. Verse 8 to 10 now starts to tell us how, why Christ is enabled to give the gifts that we're going to go on and speak about. And it says, this is what it says, when he ascended on high, and I love that song, uh, Phil Wickham's song, uh, when he ascended on high, he took many captives and gave gifts to people. This is actually a quote from Psalm 68. And Psalm 68 verse 18 says, when, when you ascended on high, you took the captives and you received gifts from the people, even the rebellious, that you, Lord God, might dwell there. So what's amazing about the psalm, and I was chatting with Rich, and he said, Gary, that's a victorious psalm. It's a, it's a psalm of victory. It's God marching, and he's marching to, to Sinai. He's going to the land of Canaan. And what he does is he, he goes up the Mount Sinai, and he goes up to Mount Zion, and it's this enemies getting scattered, and it's this like, victorious kind of army of God that Joel talks about, this army that's just going and taking over the world, pinky in the brain. But what God is saying is he's taking captives. Why? Why is God ascending Mount Zion? Because he wants to take captives and he wants to create a dwelling place that we can dwell with him. That's why when King David went out and he, and he took captive people and he brought them in, it was for the purpose that God could dwell with these people. And it's important for us to understand this, that this is this con the context of this text, that what God is wanting to do is he takes us. We were dead in our transgressions and sins. But a God who is rich in mercy, who is of great love, made us alive. In Christ Jesus. Why? Because he wants to bring us into a family of God. He wants to bring us as part of this church. And what he wants to do is to build a holy temple of these living stones. Each one of us that fits in as these bricks. And the bricks aren't the greatest thing, but imagine a stone wall. Each one of us of these living stones put together. The thing about Jesus, though, he didn't, Jesus didn't ascend Mount Zion, did he? He actually ascended into the heavenlies. Hallelujah. And that gave him the position of king. And he takes captive the mostly Gentiles and he presents himself and we become part of that temple. And it's interesting that Paul changes the wording of Psalm 68. If you read Psalm 68, it says, you receive gifts, speaking of God. And he changes the word, wording to you gave gifts. Why? Because in the new dispensation of Jesus being ascended to the high place, of him being king of the universe, of him being in charge, he is now the one who decides what to do. He pours out Holy Spirit, and he's the one that starts to give ch uh, these gifts back to the church. It's the most amazing thing for me as I prepped. I, I realized, and I said in the prayer meeting, it's another piece of the puzzle for me, that God who, who, who kind of pulls us on, pursues us, and pulls him towards us, himself, and then what he does is he repurposes us and, and gives us gifts, and then he pushes us back into his vehicle called the church in order to equip her. The most amazing picture. Verse 9. And 10 it says, but what does this mean? He ascended. And he says, well, he also just descended to the lower regions. He who descended is the very one who ascended high in all the heavens in order to fill the whole universe. Now, it's a bit of a tongue twister, isn't it? It's like a wood, chuck, a chuck, a chuck, wood, ascended, descended type moment. But the point is, is what he's trying to say is he speaks of in Philippians 2 verse 10. You know that that's the thing of every knee will bow to the name of Jesus. And he says, on heaven and on earth and on the earth below. So there's these three realms that when Jesus did what he did, he died, he lived a perfect life, he died the most horrific death, but he was resurrected and he was raised to new life and then he ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father as a prototype, as the first which we will follow when we move from Project Planet Earth into eternity. And the point that he's trying to say here is that he fills everything. Where did we hear that before? Chapter 1 verse 23, the church is... The fullness of him who fills everything in every way. Oh my goodness. We get to participate in what Jesus has done. That Jesus is the king. Jesus has made the way. He chooses the church. And then he says, by the way, guys, you are the ones who are going to go on Project Planet Earth and be the fullness of me who fills everything in every way because I have made the way because I am king of kings and lord of lords. What an amazing privilege we have as a people to be part of this process. Anyway, the point is, is what Jesus does is because he conquered death, because he ascended, what he now does is he says, here are my gifts to the church to equip her to be able to be that who she should be. And so, verse 11, this amazing text. So Christ, no one else, so Christ, Jesus, gave some to be apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers to equip the people of works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up. Notice, it's a body. 
if I came up here and I didn't have an arm or a leg or a whatever, the point is I, I'd be maimed. I, I wouldn't be as effective as I should be. So what we need to understand here is that a body cannot operate effectively unless it is joined, number one, to a head. You know, if you take someone's head off, it kind of doesn't work so well after that. And also you need the rest of the body to be able to function effectively as it should be. There's this amazing text in 1 Corinthians that says, even as the testimony about Jesus was confirmed among you, whoops, <laughs> so that you are not lacking in any gift as you wait for the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ. Interesting. It's interesting that the complete testimony of Jesus can only be presented when all the gifts are present working together effectively. Hmm. Okay. That's cool. And 1 Corinthians 2 verse 16, that we have the mind of Christ. I don't have the mind of Christ. Bruce doesn't just have the mind of Christ. Rich doesn't have just the mind. Justin doesn't. But together, when we come together, we have the mind of Christ to be able to navigate this life and this journey on Project Planet Earth. So, there are different types of gifts. Last week, Rich spoke about the second one, which I'm going to go into. This particular word, and this is, I've always said this, and the people that of Lifehouse know this, is that I have studied Greek and I understand some of the Koine Greek. I wish I could do more of it. I just haven't had the capacity to do that over the last few years. But this word gift here is the word doma. Doma. It's the doma. And this, God sovereignly gives these doma gifts. And, and they are there to serve and equip the church, as the text says. But that's different from the charismata gifts, as you can see there. The charismata in Greek. And as you can see in 1 Corinthians 12 verse 4, it says there are different kinds of gifts, but the same spirit that distributes them. It's similar wording, isn't it? Of what Rich spoke of last week. One spirit, one God, one faith, one baptism. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord, the one Lord. There are different kinds of working, but all in them and in everyone is the same God at work. They're one God. So these are all speaking together as it flows between these different books and these different texts. But the charismatic gifts are the ones, the charisma is the gifts of the Holy Spirit. But there's actually a third one, which he speaks about in 1 Corinthians 12 verse 7, and that is the manifestation gifts, the phaneros. The phaneros gifts, say that with me, phaneros. Now come on, like with the Greek, phaneros. And that's, the word actually, phone is talking about light, the light that's given as the Holy Spirit comes and manifests. And I'm going to go into a practical application of that when I touch on the prophets in a moment. And I'm not going to read those texts, but all of those gifts that come, there's a manifestation, but there's also a ministry. And then there's a mantle, but I'll get to that in a moment. So, what does he give? He gives apostles. Now, everybody thinks the apostles are the, the, the 12 disciples or you know, ultimately, you know, we had the extra one come in after Judas disappeared. But the point is, is we've got these 12 apostles, and then Paul's added as an apostle, as one who came in unnaturally born, as he says. These, these were men who, who uh, were there, were with Jesus, or witnessed Jesus, or uh, wrote scripture, and all those kind of things. And he's not talking about those apostles then. Those apostles were the one who determined doctrine, who determined the foundations of, the, uh, of how the church would be. That's why we go back to Ephesians 2.20, and it says that the church is built on the foundations of the apostles and prophets with Jesus as the chief cornerstone. Jesus is the one from which we take our plumb line, but the apostles and prophets set it in place. That's why Acts chapter 2 says that we come under the apostles' teaching because it's already put in place. If people come with these new doctrines, you've got to go, whoa, hold on a sec. Things don't change. God doesn't change. He is faithful and He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. But the word apostle means to be sent. So do we have apostles today? Of course we do. Apostles are sent to plant churches. Apostles are sent to go and connect churches. And so it's important for us to understand that, that they plant, they establish, they strengthen. That's why 1 Corinthians, as you can see there, it says, By the grace of God that's been given to me, I laid a foundation as a wise builder, and someone else is building on it. It's such a beautiful picture as an apostle that what you do is you... This isn't the church. This aircon and this slab and this, this is not the church. We are the church. We just meet in this building. But he builds the foundations upon which we now build this temple of God as living stones. I introduced Willem to you this morning. The beautiful thing about an apostle, they probably won't call themselves an apostle. But he's a man who's planted churches, who's been in ministry, who's planting businesses, who's, who's in social transformation upliftment and, and creating bases to, to uplift the poor and the needy. Rich is in, in embarking on this new season of his life. And, and watch this apostolic gift come into fruition. 
as he brings business people into a place and, and launches them into their future. That's what the apostle does. We've got apostles amongst us. There are men and, 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 and women who are able to be able to see and to look beyond. And sometimes with Rich, I go, Rich, this, that, that. He says, no, Gary, I can see it. And I'm like, I can't see it. <laughs> Come on, Gary, I can see it. It's coming. And I'm sure if you spoke to Willem, you'd be the same. It's like, no, get, Come on, we, we can see this, guys. Just keep going. Keep stepping. I know I've been this way before. They've navigated some of these things. <clears throat> in the prayer meeting, right at the end, and I can't remember who it was that spoke about it. I think it was Anthony. Do you know when Paul, the apostle, was called to his ministry? Go look at it in Acts chapter 9. And an ice comes to him and says, oh, God's calling you to be an apostle. I mean, I mean I'm paraphrasing. And he wants you to know if you want the job because he wants to tell you how much you're going to suffer for his name. I don't know about you, but that wouldn't be a great job interview for me. I'd kind of go, you know what, I'll take a skip on this one. I'd rather go fishing. Thanks very much. Well, maybe not. <laughs> if anybody knows me, I'm not a great fisherman. But the point is, well, I'll go, play, I'll go swim. There you go. Um, the point is, is that throughout all of this process, there's a cost. And so when we... When we step into what God has for us, we've got to be willing to pay the cost. And the cost sometimes is, is heavy. And I'll come into that in a moment. So prophets, let's have a look. So prophets, you've got this Old Testament set up, and uh, it's talking about how in, in the Mosaic Law you had these prophets who were probably the most authoritative spokesman for God. They, they would declare what God is doing. It's His words. It's, it's speaking for God the words of God. And they would come and they would speak. But there was quite a high penalty for getting it wrong. They would kind of stone you. And that's got nothing to do with marijuana. That's hard clipper. But now, you're, what's it? Meta um, clip And, and you're, you're going to be more stuart after a while because you've now prophesied incorrectly. And you... So I wonder if people in our current day, in our New Testament kind of prophetic kind of setup, would maybe just keep a little bit quiet if they knew that there was the, the ramifications of getting this wrong. The point that I'm trying to make, though, is that the Holy Spirit has given all of God's people the ability to prophesy now. And that's what it speaks about in Joel 2.28, where it says this. It says, And afterwards I will pour out my Spirit on all people, on their sons and daughters. They will prophesy. Old men will dream dreams, and young men will see visions. You young men, you need to be seeing visions. If you're not, you're not with God. You're not, you're not, you're not engaged in the Holy Spirit to, to allow Him to speak to you. Old men, you better be dreaming. Because if you stop dreaming, then all you do is sit at home and do nothing. And actually, God, is, you never retire as a Christian. And I want to encourage you to keep going and to become part of a community that you, you move into what God has for you. And then Acts chapter 2, even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit on those days, and they will prophesy. So it's interesting from this place that not everybody is a prophet, but everybody can prophesy. Okay, Gary, well, what are you talking about? Well, let's have a look. Oh, it's actually right there. Is number one, you've got a manifestation. So, Willem spoke about our men's evening, and I know the ladies had an evening. I don't know if they did the same thing. I mean, us guys are way more spiritual than the ladies, so I'm sure you didn't have as much kind of spiritual interaction. But we, had, we, were, we were very spiritual on Thursday. We worshipped and we prayed for one another. And uh, I'm just kidding. I'm going to get smacked. Um, and, uh, but the point is, is, in that moment, what happens is, is you, you're praying for somebody. And uh, Mongi was there, and I, and, and I prayed for him, and God gave me a word. And a manifestation of, the, of the, prof, the, the prophetic word came out, and I ministered to him in that moment. That is the phaneros. That is the manifestation in the moment. Every single one of us have the ability. Why? Because we've got Holy Spirit inside of us. Then there's people here. There's the people who have kind of a, a leaning or a, a, an edge more towards the prophetic. They kind of hear God more easily, especially when they're ministering to people. We've got people like Lee Morgan, like, like Bron, like Dale, like Paul. When, <clears throat> any moment, um, we've got uh, Anthony here. Um, bro, I, I want to stop with this moment, and, and I, and I want to declare that just the gift of a prophet over you, and the Doma gift, not, not what I'm talking about now, but I'm going to come back to you. But, uh, but the point is, is, it was a ministry moment where, where, where you, you're kind of starting to minister to people, and, and God just has this, you can just hear God's voice so easily. You just go and lay hands on, boom, there's a picture, there's a, there's a directive word, there's a whatever. And you're able to minister easily in the prophetic. But what Paul is talking about here is the Doma gift. The one that equips and services the church. The one that the church needs to be able to see the future, to become the future. 
Because often we don't know what the future looks like. Even in this time with COVID, and you go, well, how does the church look? How do we do things differently? How do we do this? You need the prophet to be able to say, hey, Gary, this is what I see. This is how I see it. This is the way we should go. But the thing about the, 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 that thing, prophecy, is that it's only in part. 1 Corinthians 13 says it's only in part. And the minute you think you've got the full picture is the minute that you need to humble yourself. Because you don't have the full picture. And that's where most prophets go wrong. Is they become prideful and they start to puff out their chest because they can see the stuff. And then when other people can't see it, they get frustrated with them. And then they cause disunity and they leave churches and they do all kinds of stuff. The only way that a prophet will um, operate in their gifting and, and in, its, in their effectiveness is with the other giftings. Especially under the authority of an apostle. That's why the apostle and prophet together are powerhouses. Because they can see the future. And they can move into it together. Because what happens is the prophet sees and he hears. And the apostle interprets and discerns the timing. He says to the prophet, hey, just calm down, buddy. We're going to get there. This is how we're going to do it. And then you've got the evangelist, pastor, and teachers who apply and administrate that vision throughout what God has for them. Such a beautiful picture of this team that works together. See, a prophet only gets, basically the revelation is the easy part. Hey, I see. Wonderful. But now what you've got to do is you've got to interpret and imply it. And if you get that wrong, you break things. So those who are called to that, understand you need to submit into an, an apostolic gift. Come alongside them and say, hey, this is what I'm feeling. This is what I'm seeing. What do you think? How do we do it? Otherwise, what happens is, is you get guys who run out into the traffic and... Boom. Anyway, I thought that was funny. There's a lot of noise around prophecy at the moment, isn't there? Especially those guys who prophesied Donald Trump's return to the White House for this next four years. And there's a lot on Facebook and all kinds of stuff. And these guys who, you know, who have gone ahead and said a whole bunch of stuff. And the problem is, is that a, a, a prophetic person can dramatically impact a church for the positive. If they are submitted and if their hearts are soft towards God. And they keep the unity of the faith. But unfortunately, my experience is most prophets have a negative impact on the church because they are susceptible to pride because of what they can see. And they're susceptible to self-centeredness. Hey, I see this. Why aren't you doing what I see? But we've got to be careful and to use the proverbial cliche, let's not throw the baby out with the bathwater. So as a community, we will, and we will make mistakes. But when you make mistakes in team, there's safety, isn't there? Both from the manifestation through to the ministry, through to the mantle. Let's train each other up. Corinthians tells us that we should desire the prophetic. We should desire to be able to speak words of encouragement and direction into people's lives because that's what God wants, it, wants to see happen. And what you'll see with a prophet is there won't be manipulation, a true prophet. They will come and they will speak the truth in love and there will be a powerful evidence that follow their words. And that's what we've got to look for. And I've spoken through some of the stuff that I've already said. You know, I had, a, I had an experience where Ashley Bell, we were at New Covenant Church, Bryanston. I was on eldership there. I was called on to the New Covenant Ministries uh, apostolic team. And uh, there was a church that was really struggling down in East London. And uh, Ash said to me, uh, Gary, come with me. We're going to go and we're going to minister into this church. So we're going to go down this weekend, you and me. I'm going to minister. This perfect example of I'm going to show you. And then next week, you're going to fly down and you're going to minister on your own. One of my first moments of, of apostolic translocal ministry. But what I saw in that first moment was a man like Ashley Bell, and I know many of you know him. He's a gifted prophet, and he's a gifted apostle. He's got like this dual gifting. So we go into this church, and there's a whole bunch of junk going down. There have been people who are not protecting the unity of that particular community, and there's been a split, and there's been ugliness, and there's tears, and there's woundedness, and there's all this. And Ashley walks in, and I'm just sitting in the, in the congregation, and he walks in, and probably about 80 people, 100 people in this room, and, and when we walked in, you could see people kind of walked in, sat down, and Ash started to minister, and he started to preach, and he started to prophesy, and the arms fell, and the chest puffed out, and the heads were lifted, and we walked out of there, and people were pumped. That is the gift of the apostolic and the prophetic, and that's why we need what Christ has given us, these amazing gifts that come into our midst, 
the Alexander Fenters of this world, the Paul Totters of this world, the Greg Stevens, the Ryan Matthews, the whatever, who have got this gift, they come in and they speak and they, they lift our heads and they get us to focus back on the purposes and the plans that God has established for us. Oh, this is going to be interesting, the rest of this one. Evangelists. Now, these are people who focus on the message of the gospel. <laughs> they have this gift of exhortation. It's amazing. They have the, the ability in the spirit to bring a response. I don't know. I'm not an evangelist. That I do know. Like when I planted a church, one of the things, somebody said, what's your biggest worry? I said, look, I'm not the most charismatic oak in the world. I mean, who's going to actually want to listen to me? Um, but okay, God's called us to this. Let's do this. And, and I'm not an evangelist. So how am I going to give this, elicit this a response in people? And at these times, I've got up here, and I, I promise you, I've given the, the most unbelievable altar call. I would have responded to it. And everyone sits there. And then five minutes later, an evangelist and Ahmed stands up and goes, hey guys, come on, God wants you. And they're all, what? What just happened? It's the way it is. It's according to what God says. Jesus gave. And so those of you who have an evangelistic gift in, you guys need to step forward. Because we need people to come to a saving knowledge of Christ. And you have that gifting and that anointing to step up and go, Hey guys, Jesus wants you. And everyone goes, Oh yeah, of course. The Billy Grahams of this world. I mean, I don't know if you've listened to Billy Graham's preaching. It's not very good. Be honest. Like, what? And but he goes, Hey, come guys, come forward. <laughs> Brian Bonker, the same thing. Can't even understand what the guy's saying with his thick German accent or whatever it was. And yet when he, when he preached and his gifting came up, <laughs> millions of people saved. I, I don't get it, but that's the way God has done it. We need evangelists. I don't think we have any practicing evangelists in our, in our community right now. We're stepping into what God has for them. There should be visitors here every week because we've got evangelists in our midst. And there should be an altar call going out. Come on. Come on, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Come and give your life to him. Anyway, the problem with evangelists is they don't preach the whole counsel of God. So think about the evangelists we've known who've fallen off the wagon. What do they do? They all of a sudden go weird. They kind of go and they bring this new doctrine in because they are not gifted in that way. Again, if they are not submitted to the, the apostles and the prophets, they go on their own merry way and they mess it up. So if you're an evangelist, don't go and do your own thing. Come under the authority of the apostles and prophets to make sure that you don't go off on this weird doctrine, that you spray doom on people and all kinds of stuff. No, I'm serious. That guy who was spraying doom on people, there's no question he's an evangelist. But oh my goodness, you muppet, that's not going to help the church. Anyway, I'm, I'm going to get sidetracked if I keep going. And then lastly, what's interesting about this in the Greek is that there's no article there between the, uh, the pastors and the teachers. And so most people believe that the Greek wording is actually that you're a pastoring teacher or you're a teaching pastor. And so you've got kind of a bent towards the other, but these kind of gifts come together as one, but they are kind of separately um, meted out or walked out in a way. So what you have is you have pastors who are teachers, but they're very good with people. They're just amazing. Like a, a Paul Elliott would be like that kind of person who's just an amazing pastor, but he can teach in an amazing way too. And they spend a lot of time with people. You've got Bruce and Leisha who are the same. Amazing people who, who just, many of you I know, I can sit here and I can see whose lives have been touched by these people. Who just pastor people and love on people. Then you've got teachers who are pastors. And those are people who are, who are good at teaching, who are good at you know, going through the Bible. The Michael Eatons of this world. The, the John Pipers of this world. The purpose of these gifts, well, we've already gone through it. Whoop. It's gone. Okay, the purpose of these gifts was, I think I went backwards, eh? No, 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 it's gone. My, my, my text is gone. Anyway, it's fine. The purpose of these gifts is to equip the people for the works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we reach the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God. And so this word equipping, okay, so now we've got to get into the Greek because this is a, you can see it's a cool word. I mean, you can just see by the, by the lettering. So it's katar, the P is actually an R, Katartismos. Katartismos. Come on. Katartismos. That is to equip, but that's the noun. So you've got to go to the verb, and the verb is the word katartizo. Come on. Okay, so you know it's katartizo. And that means, as you can see, is to, to mend and to unite and to mobilize. So this word is used throughout the, the New Testament in different contexts 
to, to mend nets, to mobilize, to unite people. And so those gifts and the gifts of the pastors and teachers is to do all of those things, to mend, to unite, to mobilize. The, the apostle, the prophet, the evangelist is to do all of these things. Now notice what the equipping is for. The equipping is to build up the body of Christ, to be the church, to reach the unity of the faith, and to have the knowledge of God. So what's important here is for us to understand. Remember, this whole process was we have Holy Spirit who empowers us, chapter 1. We have this whole process where God begins to give us gifts. So we've got power of Holy Spirit. It's amazing. But now we're like a baby with a power tool. And we need these gifts to come alongside us and mentor us and to be able to set us up from the right direction and train and equip the church for the works of service that God has called us to. I don't know where the other texts are. I've lost two of my texts, but it's fine. And it's, Paul goes on to describe what maturity looks like. Uh, chapter, uh, verse 13 says, um, we need to become mature, attaining the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Remember that. Remember that whole process. Oh, it is there. No, it's not there. It's gone. Wait. Sorry. I'm messing everyone around here. It is there. I'm actually going to go for it. Then we will no longer be infants, tossed back and forth by the waves, and blown here and there by every wind of teaching, by the cunning and craftiness of people and their deceitful schemings. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become, in every respect, the mature body of Him, who is the head, that is Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and held together, is every, in every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love, as each part does its work. So what we can see is the goal of this whole thing is that we grow up. I, 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 think, I think if Jesus was here, it would probably be the word that he would say to us most, and probably to me the most. He'd sit down with me and he'd say, Gary, you need to grow up. Put your pride in your pocket. Forgive. Repent. Grow up. And actually, you need people around you to be able to strengthen you so that we can go forward. So what does this maturity look like? It looks like Jesus. If you want to know what you should look like and to become more like him, we have power of Holy Spirit and we have a picture of who Jesus is. Chapter 1 tells us that we have the spirit of wisdom and revelation, that we would know him better, that we would know the hope to which he has called us, the glorious inheritance in God's people, that we would know this incomparably great power for those who believe, that we would have those things. Why? Because verse 23 talks about the fullness of him. The church being the fullness of Him who fills everything in every way. Which moves on to chapter 3, which tells us that we are strengthened by the power, uh, by the power of the Spirit in a man. Why? To know love that surpasses knowledge that we may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Huh. So this is part of the process. That we have these gifts that help us get full with the full measure of God. So that we are equipped to do the works of service that God has called us to. Maturity helps us stay unified. And keeps us on the journey with God's purpose. The apostle keeps bringing us back. The, the, the prophet looks and sees. And sees the things out there. You know, one of the things is, is maturity, what's going to happen is we stop acting like children. I wonder when we get to that place in the church where we are stop acting like children. And we rather look on what God is wanting to do with us. And sometimes we have to step back. Sometimes we have to have the humility to step back. That's why I honor Willem and Natalie. They've realized that where they are, they need to just step back for a season. I, I can follow a man like that. I can follow a man with scars. I can't follow a man who thinks he knows everything. And what ha often happens is, as you can see, you get these people who come in with these strange teachings. And I mean, some of the stuff that comes into the church, you're like, what are you? Like, seriously, where did you get that? Certainly not from in the Bible that I read. I know you've probably added the book of opinions, but it's certainly not God's opinion. And we get fooled by these strange teachings. We need to be a people who speak the truth in love. That we have this combination of the strong boldness to follow the truth of God. And to be able to love on people who oppose us. We have a wave coming at us around gender. Around men who think they're women and women who think they're men. In Australia there is legislation in Victoria... That if you counsel somebody who has same-sex attraction or some transgender, whatever we want to call that, it's a criminal offense, offense up to 10 years in jail. Just by speaking to them. Just by praying with them. We have this wave coming to us. Are we going to be able to stand? Love on people who, who, who are struggling through different things. Through gender dysphoria and all of those kind of things. Or do we? 
So, oh, no, it's fine. Let's just twist the scripture so we can make it work. Paul describes, as Rich describes, all of these people, this diversity coming together. He finishes off with that. That we all come together with the variety of giftings that we have. That we have these connecting parts. And he, he shows the body. Think of my body, all the, the, the veins and the, the, the nervous system and how the body works. It's the same thing as the church. We have all the hands and feet and the, the body and, and actually some of the most important parts are the heart and the lungs and the, the liver and all those kind of things we can't see. Some of you guys who set up this morning, I was standing here, I was here early just to see the things were happening. My control freakness, sorry guys. But the point is, is that the, the point is, is, is that you guys aren't seen. No, this doesn't just happen. Do you know that? For those of you who just arrived here, this doesn't just kind of, oh, thanks Lord. There are people that were, that were here at like early this morning, half past six, seven, setting up. JP, I want to honor you, my friend. I mean, yeah. This man lost his job because of COVID. He has been through hell and back. And yet, what has he done? He has thrown himself into this community and, and, and served her. He is here every day. This is actually his idea. He, he told the Econ guy how to do this. Just by the way. They debated it for two hours and then they realized, no, this is the best way to do it. We have an amazing gift there. And I want to honor you this morning, JP, for all that you do for us. And I know you're hiding. Point is, is it provides life, doesn't it? J JP provided life here this morning, behind the scenes. He's one of the lungs that breathes the life of God, the generosity, the giving. The thing is, is when we're healthy, we grow. We had Jenna who, I don't know if she's here. She's not going to get upset with me. Yeah, okay, she's hiding. But she had um, uh, reflux. And at the, at the, by the age of two, she still didn't have any hair. And, and this thing was causing problems. She wasn't growing. And we had to take a big decision. Like, what do we do with this? And we, we took her to this Professor Bill, who I know is now up for some crazy stuff. But... But he was the one who separated those Siamese twins and stuff, so he's, he certainly was a great surgeon. And anyway, the point is, is she has this laparoscopic Nissan at two. You know, they go in and they do all the stuff. I've had it done as well, so she probably inherited it from me. And, but the point is, once that was fixed, and once it was working properly, she grew. She was a tiny little tot. We used to watch her get up onto the blocks, and we've still got video footage of her. She's probably like this high compared to the other one. Look, she's got the biggest heart you've ever seen, and she beat the big girls. But the point is, is once the body was working and once the body started to go and that, that was, everything was unblocked and the, the, the reflux wasn't coming up and causing problems, imagine the church healthy. Imagine the church doing and everyone doing their part and the flow and the presence of God and the healthiness. Do you know what? The presence of God falls in a way that will stop traffic here. I've prophesied this from the day we arrived on this property. We will look out this window, I'm hoping in months, but maybe years to come, and there will be a backup of traffic for people not coming to Life House, not coming to hear Gary, not coming to hear Richard, not coming to hear Bruce or Paul or Louise or whoever, but because the presence of God is here and people just want to come and bathe in it. I just want to thank God for the gifts that he's given the church. Maybe we can take a moment. Think of the people that you know are gifts around you. And maybe even call them up. Maybe even go to them after the meeting if they're here. I just want to thank you. I want to thank you that Jesus has given you as a gift to this community or whatever it might be. I thanked Alexander Fenter this morning. I texted him and I said, thank you, Alexander. I'm preaching on Ephesians 4 this morning. And I just realized that you are a gift to me and a gift to Lifehouse Church. And I want to honor you. And I want to thank you that you've been a pillar of strength for me over this season. Crazy thing is, he's preaching on Ephesians 4, 1 to 16 this morning in a vineyard church online. Here's the thing. Is God has given gifts. Remember, Jesus apportioned it. And I'm, I know there's people sitting here right now. Like I've said, Anthony, Anthony, I want to prophesy over you that God has called you to be a prophet. I think you know that. Why don't you come here, please? 
and maybe as a precursor. Yeah, I mean, this is always a, a real challenge, but... Rich, Bruce, Louise, come. Leash, Anita, Paul, Ange, maybe she may be. I think she's at kids. I didn't have this in my notes. I'm not trying to, just in the moment, I feel God wanting to, hi is highlighting you. And I know through various means, we've had conversations, and I know you see the future. And I know that you can help Lifehouse Church and other churches become the future that God wants them to be. And so, Lord, I want to lay hands on Anthony right now. And I know you've called him to be a prophet to the nations. And so, Lord, this, this morning, and actually, I, I, Laura, I feel that this ministry is nowhere near where it should be without you and so it's a team because I know that you both operate in the prophetic in a profound way but this it's like you, you don't often see a husband and wife operate in the same gifting and I believe together you're going to have a profound impact on Lifehouse Church into the future and the nations and the churches of this area and into, and into the, the surrounding Johannesburg regions and into South Africa and to the ends of the earth you guys are connected and God's starting to release your voice as he gives you dreams, as he gives you visions. And so, Lord, I, I release this couple, Lord, into what you have called them into in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Unlock, Lord. Unblock. <laughs> Amen. Anything else? I just had a picture for you guys of a, a tandem bicycle, and a tandem bicycle is something completely different, and you guys are something completely different. You are set apart in this calling that you have, and people are going to turn to you, but not because you are different, but because you are Christ-centered and you have the heart of the Father, and that bicycle for two can go so much further. There's a song in there, but I won't sing it now. <laughs> bicycle made for two. Anyway, that was just for you. I want to ride my bicycle. Okay. We get that, that digress. So, to end this morning, I know it's been a long morning because uh, there's been a lot. We, we've had a full morning already. If the team can come up, because I do think we need to finish off with that last worship song. But before we do that, I want to ask you. You see, here's part of the problem is when, when you ask this question, people go, well, I'm not going to respond because I don't want to think I'm bigger than what I think I am. But if Christ has spoken to you, if the Holy Spirit has spoken to you that you are supposed to be a Doma gift to help equip and strengthen the church, then who are you to sit there and go, hmm, no thanks, Lord? Well, I suppose, well, let me rephrase that. Of course you can say that. But if you're saying it because you don't want to stand up and seem like you're saying something that's kind of, oh, I'm a big deal, I'm, I'm saying, don't, please don't do that this morning. I feel like this is a moment where we can say, who feels that they're called to one of those fivefold giftings? And if you call to those fivefold giftings, I want you to stand, please. Brilliant. I'm going to give one more opportunity. Who feels that they are called to this? Don't hold back. If you feel that God has said anything, if you have an inkling, and you could be wrong, that's okay. Even from an eldership point of view, it says if you desire eldership, you desire a noble good thing. Now I'm going to ask for something else because it's easier to sit by your chair because it's kind of like, okay, here's my safety net. I want you to come and step off the carpet as a prophetic declaration that you are saying, Jesus, I'm available for what you want of me to equip and strengthen the local body and the believers of church. One of the things I didn't say was that apostles, prophets, pastors, and teachers actually connect churches across the globe. I left that out, it was in my notes. 
is that they don't only come and equip us, but you've got the poor Tartals and the Alexander Fenders of this world and the people like Willem who, who will connect churches. So it's not the connectivity and the body is not just for us, it's for a wider connectivity as the four ways pastors connect and all of those kind of things. Gee whiz, I didn't expect. If you're standing, please come forward. If you can. And the reason why I'm asking you because there's a prophetic declaration that when you, it's like when you act, when, when, you, when you step out, you, you're saying to the heavenlies, you're saying to the principalities and powers, this is what I'm doing. And I know Bruce, <laughs> Bruce texted me this morning and said, hey Gary, can we do communion? I said, Bruce, are you crazy? It's COVID and this takes a lot of planning and you can see we've individually packed. So thank you so much to Linda and your team. I saw Debbie. Uh, Charmaine, you guys are amazing. You did this in like next to no, no time whatsoever. Yeah, blame it on the bunny. But I don't know about you, Bruce. I mean, I know you can, you can lead this in a moment, but I, I think it'd be helpful for all of us to take communion as part of this moment. And as you can see, individually packed stuff, individual juices, so you don't have to worry about sucking COVID up or eating COVID of somebody else. Um, you'll see it's marked for two or for four if you're a family or whatever the case is. And so we can come up and take communion in a moment. But I think it's part of what God wants to do for us to do this in remembrance of what Jesus has done so that we can step into what God has for us. Jesus needs us. When I say needs, of course he could flick his fingers and we could, he could do it. But he chooses to partner with us as his church. And you guys are the gifts to be able to equip and strengthen and build the church going forward. So why don't you just stand in a, in a place of recept re receptivity. Father, I thank you. I thank you for sending Jesus to Project Planet Earth that pursued a Muppet like me who lived a perfect life and died a horrific death. And Lord, in that you displayed your great love for me that even when I was dead in my transgressions and sins, Lord, you made me alive in Christ. And I know you've done that for each one of us. And yet, God, what you've also done is you've taking us captive. You've captivated our hearts, Lord Jesus. And as we behold the beauty of your holiness, as we get caught up in who you are, and as we become more like you, we know that you've released these people. And I don't know how to do this, Lord, because there's so many people here. But I'm going to try to do it very quickly. And Lord, I, I just lay hands on everyone. And Lord, I pray that there would be a boldness and a courage to be released into all of what you have been speaking to them. <laughs> Lord, like one of my favorite things to say is that sometimes I feel like Father Abraham, where you called him to be the father of many nations and he had no, ki no kids at all. And I know that many people would feel like that right now, that they feel like, but who am I that you are mindful of me, Lord? But God, you've called these people, every single one of them, Lord, to be the Doma gifts into your body to strengthen, Lord, from business, Lord, to apostolic, to the prophetic and the evangelism, Lord, for the pastoring. So, Lord, thank you for every single one of these people. And I pray that you would release them into the river of your purposes in life house and below, beyond. To you be the glory forever and ever. It's a beautiful story in Luke chapter 24 about two followers of Jesus. They just put him in the tomb, and they were walking, walking down the road. Two days had passed, and this was the third day. And Jesus drew near to them, and they didn't recognize him. He'd been dead two days. Their hopes had been dashed. The woman went into the cave, and they came out and said, He is not there. 
And as they were walking down, Jesus came with them, and he walked with them, and they went to their place of abode. And it was in the moment when they broke bread and gave thanks that their eyes were opened and they recognized Jesus. And what a story for us, perhaps, as we're walking this journey of COVID and these times where we have physical, spiritual things that are going on, emotional challenges, because life is hard, damn hard right now. But when they took bread and broke bread and gave thanks, they recognized Jesus. In this moment, I would love us all to go and take some of the elements. And in your time where you are, maybe go and get them now. And in your time where you are, Jesus, we acknowledge your broken body. Jesus, we acknowledge the blood that was shed with these elements, symbolic elements. And we give thanks to you, Father God. We give thanks to you for your son, Jesus, who died for us. And we acknowledge that. And we give you thanks, Lord. And just like these people, when they had broken and they recognized Jesus, what did they do? They went out and told others. They became evangelists. And Gary's had a call on our lives here today about those. We need more evangelists. So I pray this morning as we take these elements and we give thanks that God will give us a boldness to step out and go and tell others about our King and Lord Jesus Christ. When you have your elements, I'd just like you to bow your head and let's pray. Just like before a meal, as we sit down at dinner, before we break bread, we give thanks. So before we take these elements, let's just give thanks. As you're sitting there, let's pray. There's still our minds. Still your mind and quiet your heart right now in front of the Most High. Lord God, draw each one of us here, Lord, into a deeper and closer fellowship with you. As together we take of these emblems, as we take of these tokens, as we take of these symbols, in remembrance of what you have done for us, what you did on that cross of Calvary, Lord God. We're praying in acknowledgement of the enormity of our sin that you have cancelled. For the debt that is owed, that has been cancelled. Your body that was broken and your blood that flowed and was shed. May we feed on you as it were, Lord God, in our hearts by faith this morning. And walk worthy of our calling, as we so aptly heard this morning, our calling, Lord God. You have a calling on our, on our lives, each one of us individually. The calling that we have in Jesus Christ this morning. May we live a life that glorifies and honors your name. We praise and glorify your mighty lane, King Jesus. And we proclaim your death until you come again.